So, yes. uh, well, thank you. Thank you all for being here in my public defense. So today I'm going to talk about the, the work I did in my PhD, which is about an on-chip CO2 sensor based on uh, non-dispersive infrared spectroscopy. So the project is uh, funded by Malaxis. It's a Belgian company making all kinds of sensors. So this is the this is the overview for today. So uh, well, uh, the presentation consists of three parts. So in the first part, I'm going to break down uh, the the title of my thesis. So so the first section answers the why question: Why do we need uh, CO two sensors? And the second section answers the how question: How we are going to make uh, CO two sensors on chip CO two sensors? And the third section, I will, I will explain, you will see that by making the sensors on chip, we can have a small and cheap CO2 sensor. So the second uh, big part is the main dish for the for, for my presentation. It's about, well, we know that uh, a gas sensor consists of three parts, right? The first part is the light path. So in this, we're, in this work, we are using an integrating cylinder as the lead path, and you will see uh, what an integrating cylinder is. So the next part is about the source and detector integration, and then I will show you some uh, experimental uh, results on the fully integrated CO2 sensor. And at last, I have the conclusion and outlook. So well, let's start the first part, which is the breakdown of the uh, of the title. So uh, first of all, uh, a bit of motivation. Why do we need CO2 sensors? Well, the main drive of this uh, project is from the uh, EU's ban on the HFCs in the uh, mobile air conditioning systems. Well, HFCs are just the cooling agents in the uh, air conditioning systems uh, in passenger cars. Well, it turns out that uh, besides the CO2 emitted directly from the, from the passenger cars, the HFCs account for uh, roughly 30% of the total uh, greenhouse gas emission. So, uh, so there is a ban in the in the in the directive of of, of EU because of uh, because of the uh, global warming problem, and they want to well uh, CO2. It turns out that uh, CO2 is uh, is a proper substitute for the cooling agents in the uh, in the MSC systems. So you can imagine that if you if 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 you have a if you have a CO two tank on board with high with high pressure, that uh, there is a there there is a quite some high risk for leakage. So you can see on the in the figure on the right that when the when when only fifty percent of CO two in the tank is released, so the CO two concentration in the cabin can go up to like sixteen percent in just uh, in just a few minutes. At well, CO2 is non-toxic, but at such high concentration of CO2, you can easily pass out in less than in less than one minute. That would be very dangerous for the for the traffic and for the passengers on board. So we want to make a CO2 sensor that you can carry on board to detect this leakage and to remove the safety concerns. So for this application, the CO2 in the uh, MAC in the MAC systems. The detection limits uh, is is not wide, is not very high. The the requirements on the detection limit is not high. A detection limit of, uh, for example, uh, a few percent can be can be enough. But you need the sensor to be fast because you want to detect the leakage before before anything uh, happens. So the next uh, application of CO two sensors is in the air quality monitoring. We know that in a in a closed uh, in a closed environments, for example, in office buildings, humans are the main source of CO2 uh, generation. Well, basically, the CO2 concentration in your breath is roughly four percent, and an average person breathes out about one kilo of CO2 every day. So, in a in a in a closed environment, the CO2 uh, the CO2 can quickly accumulate, and the CO2 concentration in the room can go up. So here you see the CO2 concentration in the office building during one day. You see that at in the afternoon, the CO2 concentration in the room can go up to like uh, 1,800 ppm. So if 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 
if you are if you are exposed to this uh, high concentration of CO2, like 2000 ppm, you have the you will have the so-called sick uh, building syndromes. That means you can get uh, drowsy and dizzy. So you want a CO2 sensor uh, in the office building to monitor the air quality monitor to, to monitor the, the the air quality and to tell to tell you when to open the window, for example. So for this application, the require the, the requirement on the detection limit is is high. You need a detection limit of uh, below uh, 100 ppm. Well, uh, well, these are difficult times. Well, I mean, the because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this is is a very sad story. A lot of people are infected and died because of because of this. Be, well, apart from wear, wearing face masks and keep social distance, what else can we do? So it turns out that there is a there is some correlation between Corona and the CO2. We know that Corona is airborne; is often spread by coughing and talking. Well, it turns out that the are something called aerosols are responsible for this uh, for this uh, spread. Aerosols are just the small particles with diameters of several micron. The aerosols. If if they are carrying particles, they can they can float in the air for for a few hours. So we know that CO2 is co-exhaled with uh, aerosols. If you have more CO2 in the room, that means you have more various carrying particles in the room. That means you have a higher risk for infection. So you may want a CO2 sensor to to reduce the 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 infection risk by monitoring the CO2 concentration in the room. Well, the, there are there, there are other applic uh, there are other applications. For example, in greenhouse farming, it is demonstrated that you can have more than twenty percent of crop yield increase by effectively uh, applying gaseous CO two fertilizers. So, for the greenhouse farming uh, application, you may want a CO two sensor to monitor the uh, CO two concentration in a greenhouse and to maxim and to maximize crop yield. For this application, you probably need a detection limit of a few hundred ppm. Well, in the in the medical domain, there is something called capnography. In capnography, basically it's the, the device measures the waveform of, of the CO2 concentration in your breath. So for for example, if you have an obstacle in the in the in the airway, the waveform of the CO2 condition will be different than a, uh, from a healthy person. For example, here you see a normal waveform of CO2 condition of CO2 condition in your breath. It's more like a square wave. But if you have, if one person has asthma, for example, the waveform of CO2 condition will be different. So by mirroring the CO2 condition waveform, you can tell if the person is 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 healthy or not. So to conclude on the why question, we want to do CO2 sensor because there is a huge market. Well, the CO2 sensor, the total CO2 sensor market is is expected to grow up to 3.6 billion in 2024, with a growth rate of 50%. So, if if you look at the CO2 sensor markets, if you look at the CO2 sensor markets, you find something like this. For example, the first one. Is from Sense Air. It's about five centimeter by five centimeter, and it's cost you eighty five euros. And the second one is from Gas Sensing Solutions in UK. It's a base boiler, about uh, three three centimeter by two centimeter, and it's cost you a bit more, about one hundred twenty euros. Well, the the performance of these CO two sensors are quite similar. They all have a detection limit of about fifty ppm. And uh, they have a response time of 30 seconds. So the goal of this PhD is to make a CO2 sensor that is 10 times smaller than those ones and 10 times cheaper than those ones. So the next uh, part is about the how question. How do we make CO2 sensors? Well, we use a technology called non-dispersive infrared spectroscopy. Well, let's first look at the dispersive spectroscopy. 
So in a, in a, in a, in a dispersive uh, spectros spectroscopy device, you have a lattice source, and the lattice source is split into different colors by prism. So at the output, you look at uh, which color is missing. That means the color is absorbed by the gas or liquid. So by looking uh, by looking how much light at that color is is absorbed, you can calculate the concentration uh, of the of a gas or 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 a liquid. So this is the dispersive uh, spectroscopy. In a non-dispersive spectroscopy, you do not have this uh, prism. You do not have a diffraction element to to split the light into different colors. Basically, you have only the light source and then a light path. In the light path, the light will be absorbed by the analytes, and you have the detector by looking at uh, by looking at the detector, uh, by measuring how much light is absorbed, you can calculate the concentration uh, in the in the in the analytes. So the working principle of the IR is quite simple. It's, it's simple. It's as simple as a cup of tea. Well, the 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 tea here looks like uh, looks uh, right because it's absorbed the green parts and the blue parts of the of the light. So the the more it absorbs, that means uh, the dark the tea is 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 the same working principle of an of non-dispersive infrared spectroscopy. So the next uh, part is about the infrareds. So here you see the the whole electro electro uh, magnetic uh, spectrum spans from gamma rays all the way to radio waves. Well, it's uh, it turns out uh, in the in the infrared region, you can see a lot of you can see the absorption spectrum of the common of the common gases. This is called the mid infrared fingerprinted region. You can see the common gases, CS4, CO2, and other other gases like ammonia and the CO. CO2 sensing, we use the uh, we use the wavelength at 4.3 micron. Well, we know that a CO2 molecule consists of uh, one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Atoms. So the a CO2 molecule either can stretch like this horizontal, like this. The 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 basically the two oxygen the two oxygen molecules uh, stretch in opposite directions. This is called the symmetric the symmetric stretching. Well, this stretching is, is not uh, infrared active, but it's responsible for the Raman shift for, uh, for, for CO2. And the second one is the anti-symmetric anti stretching. Well, the, the two oxygens stretch in the, in the same direction. For this one, for this stretching, it is AR, it is, it is infrared active. It is responsible for the absorption spectrum of uh, CO2 at 4.3 micron. If you look at the magnitude of this uh, absorption, it's, it's quite large. It's nearly 300 uh, per centimeter. This is, the, this is the working principle of the NDR CO2 sensors. It's based on uh, Bear Lambert law. Basically, if you have a medium, any medium, the light, as the light propagates through through the medium, the intensity of the light will be expand will be exponentially decayed. So by looking at uh, by looking at the output, by looking at the light intensity at the output, you can calculate how much light is uh, is is absorbed by the uh, by the medium, and then you can calculate the concentration of the gas or the liquid. So on the right, you see. On the right, you see a typical NDR CO2 sensor. The sensor consists of uh, infrared source, a, a, brand, a, a broadband source, and then you have the reflective tube, which is also your waveguides. So the light uh, propagates in this uh, in this tube, and it gets uh, it gets uh, absorbed uh, by the gas. And then you have two optical detectors. One for the one for the sensing channel and the one for the reference channel. And the wavelength selection is a, is is achieved by the two uh, filters in front of these detectors. So for CO two sensing, we typically use as uh, we typically use the wavelength at four point three micron for the sensing channel, 
And for the reference channel, we use a wavelength at 3.9 micron because there's basically no, no other molecules absorb at, at, at this wavelength. So there are there are several advantages uh, of the uh, of this technology. For example, there is no cross sensitivity because there is no spectral overlap between the CO2 absorption spectrum and other gases. And the sensors based on this technology are cheap and robust and has low power consumptions. If you if you look at the CO2 sensor markets, roughly 90% of CO2 sensors are based on this technology. So the, uh, this slide is for the non-photonic people. Uh, basically, is is about a waveguide based sensing. If you have a silicon wire waveguides, the optical energy will not be con will not be completely confined in the waveguides. You will have some evanescent lights in the colliding, which is the which is defined by the uh, confinement factor, which is basically. The ratio of the uh, optical energy in the cladding divided by the total optical energy. So for for a silicon wire waveguides, uh, the the confinement factor in there is about 20%. So that means you have about 20% of lights in the cladding. Well, if if it if you put another silicon wire waveguide close enough to the first one, you will have a slot waveguide. For a slot waveguides. Uh, the confinement factor in there is about uh, 70%. So this is a very simple schematic of the uh, of the uh, of a sensor. You have the light source, and uh, from the light source, you have a fraction of uh, optical power coupled to the waveguides. And in the waveguides, you will have some losses. So the first term here is the is the waveguide propagation loss. And the second term here is the loss due to uh, due to absorption, and then the the light is detected by the by the optical detector. So well, after some mathematics, you have an equation like this. The the delta C here is the uh, is the concentration change of the gas you want to detect, and then you have the uh, waveguide loss and the absorption over here and the uh, the power in the waveguides and the power at the detector. So in order to in order to detect lower CO2 concentrations, that means you want to detect a smaller delta C. Well, if you look at this equation, to make this uh, delta C smaller, you either can uh, increase the gas downstairs or in or or decrease the gas upstairs. So for uh, for for increase the for increase the gas uh, downstairs, you can increase the power in the waveguides in, in this term, and you can also increase the confinement factor in there. That's 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 the gamma here, and also you want to decrease the waveguide loss over here. So uh, in this project, in this project, we propose uh, three on-chip CO2 sensor configurations. So the first one is a multi-slot waveguides, and the second one is the hollow waveguides, and the third one is the integrating cylinder. I will, I, will, I will explain them one by one. So for the multi for the multi-slot waveguides, the structure is like this. Basically, is uh, waveguides only. Uh, uh, on the SOI uh, platform, you have the silicon substrates, you have you have the buried uh, oxide layer, and then you have the silicon, you have the silicon waveguide layer. Well, in the in the silicon waveguide layer, we make we make uh, some uh, slots. Well, it turns out that if the if if the dimensions of the slot are much smaller than the wavelength. The waveguide itself will will be will like a, uh, will be like an average medium for the for the lights. So by making these uh, multi slots, uh, we can we can increase the we can increase the confinement factor in there. And the waveguide is is multi model because we are using very large core of the waveguides. And uh, by using a multi model waveguides, we can increase the power couples uh, to to the waveguides. And then we we under edge the silicon oxide layer under the under the silicon under the silicon layer to reduce the absorption loss of the silicon oxide because silicon oxide has a very high absorption at 4.3 micron. 
So basically, to make such a waveguide, you need uh, electron beam lithography to define the, the sub-wavelength uh, sub -wavelength slots. And then you need deep reactive unetching to etch the silicon. And you need uh, HF uh, for the silicon oxide etching. So here are some simulations from the uh, from the mode solutions. Here you see the mode. Uh, here you see the mode uh, profile of the T of the first two T modes and the first two T M modes. So for the T modes, uh, you have the most of light will be in the slots. That's because of the boundary conditions of the max of the Maxwell equations. So the confinement factor in there is about eighty percent. For the TM modes, uh, mo most of the lights will be the will be in the silicon strips. The confinement factor is a bit uh, is a bit lower. It's about three. Uh, is about thirty five percent. So, uh, so you can see that by using a multi mode approach, we can have a very high confinement factor of the waveguides. For the for the propagation loss of the waveguides, we know that the propagation loss of the waveguides is from the is many from the uh, scattering loss at the set loss, and the scattering is is inversely proportional to the fourth power of the waveguides, because we are because we are working at a wavelength at 4.3 micron, that is much larger than the than 1.5 micron. So we 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 expect the propagation loss at the at, at 4.3 micron to be to be lower uh, than at one at one point uh, five micron, and the the waveguide is multimodal. There are probably thousands of modes uh, in the waveguides, so scattering scattering of one mode can well one mode. Can be scattering can be scattered into other modes, and that's not that's cannot be accounted as loss. So by using a multi-mode waveguide, you will have lower losses than a single mode waveguide. So well, the, the multi-mode waveguide is is fun, is 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 nice, but it involves e-beam for for fabrication. So here we propose the second uh, sensor configuration. Which is about a hollow core waveguide. It allows you to get rid of the e beam. So basically, in the waveguides, you have two silicon substrates. Uh, on one substrate, well, the fabrication is here. It starts with uh, two silicon substrates, and then you do a uh, deep reactive etching on one substrate to etch the waveguide a trench, and then you do gold deposition. On, on both uh, substrates, and then you do wafer bonding of the two substrates, and then you have the waveguide. Well, the, the reason we use gold uh, as a reflector here is that gold has a very high reflectivity at 4.3 micron. You can see the plot over here. The average, the average uh, reflectivity of gold at 4.3 micron is, is, is about 99%. The, uh, here is the simulation of the propagation lots uh, of the hollow waveguides at 4.3 micron. You can see that uh, as as I increase the waveguide width, the propagation loss decreases. Well, it, it turns out that the the waveguide loss of these hollow core waveguides is inversely proportional to the to the third power uh, of the size of the core. So we we choose. Uh, uh, if we, we choose a waveguide that is uh, three, 300 micron, and the waveguide, the, the simulated waveguide propagation loss is about 2 dB per centimeter. Well, the, the good thing here using the using the hollow core waveguide is that you can have a confinement factor in there that is uh, 100%. Well, the, the, third, the third approach here is the Niguini cylinder. The Niguini cylinder comes from the question that can we make the sensor even smaller? Well, the, the answer is, of course, we can. We know that the multi slot waveguides and the hollow core waveguides are single pass approach. That means in order to increase the interaction length uh, of the lights and CO2, you have to increase the physical length you have to increase the physical length uh, of the waveguides. And that means you have to increase the, the the footprints, the size of the sensor. 
So can we increase the interaction length uh, without increasing the, the size? Well, yes, we can. Uh, we use an optical cavity. So here is the schematic uh, 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 of the inequality cylinder. Well, I will talk about the inequality cylinder in the second part. So to conclude on the first part, we want to make, uh, we want to do CO2 sensing because there's a huge market. We have all these kind of applications and the list goes on. And by using uh, NDIR technology, we can have uh, a CO2 sensor with high sensitivity because of the, because of the huge uh, CO2 absorption at 4.3 micron. And there's basically no interference from other molecules because there is no overlap uh, of the of the absorption spectrum. And by making the by making the CO2 sensor on chip, we can have a small and cheap CO2 sensor. And we also uh, we proposed three sensor configurations: the multi-slot waveguide, the hollow core waveguide, and the and the integrated cylinder. And the integrating cylinder is the most promising because because of the fabrication uh, process is 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 much simpler, and the footprints uh, of the sensor is is much smaller. So the second part is the is about the fully integrated uh, NDR C2 sensor. So here you see a uh, you see a uh, 3D schematic of the sensor. So basically the the sensor consists of Two silicon substrates. You have the top. You have the top silicon substrate, which contains the integrating cylinder, on the top substrate, and then you also have the bottom substrate. Well, we integrated the the, the light source, which is a mid infrared LED, and also two photodiode mid infrared photodiode on the bottom substrate, and then the sensor is formed by wafer bonding of the two silicon substrates. So here again, you see the schematic of the integrating cylinder here. Well, basically you have you have a cylindrical cavity and then you have three access waveguides, one for the input waveguides and two for the output waveguides. So the two output waveguides can, can act as the sensing arm and the reference arm for a sensor. And we use GOAT reflector. So here I defined the, the radius of the cylinder as the R and the width of the access waveguide as D. So the, the whole benefit of this uh, integrating cylinder is that the light can interact with a CO2 multi -tap, multiple times before reaching the detector. So you will have a very long effective path length on a very small footprint of the sensor. Here are, the, here are some uh, simulations of the integrating cylinder. So the first figure is for the effective uh, equivalent uh, path length. You can see that as it increase the radius of the cylinder, the effective, uh, the equivalent path length increases. That because you increase the, if you increase the, if, if you increase the radius, you have a larger cylinder and the light is trapped more uh, uh, for a longer time in the cylinder. You have a longer path length, and you can also see that I, as I decrease, as I decrease the uh, the the waveguide width, you the the path length also increases for the same reason. And then you see that for the total proper the, for the total transmission loss, you have the same behavior. And uh, in the in the third figure, you see that the sensitivity uh, uh, of the sensor for 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 a thousand ppm CO2, the sensitivity here is defined as the transmission change when there is CO2 and when there is when there uh, is no CO2. So you see that as I increase the the cylinder radius, the sensitivity first increases and then decreases. And for every waveguide width, I have an optimum, I have an optimal uh, cylinder radius, which is summarized over here. So that uh, you see that we can optimize the sensitivity, we can optimize the sensitivity for for a certain radius and waveguide width combination. For the a uh, for the experimental char char characterizations. We use a cylinder with with, uh, with a radius of two millimeter and waveguide width of 200 micron. 
So uh, such a such an integrating inig cylinder will give you a effective path length of 3.5 centimeters, and the total transmission loss from the from the input waveguide to the output waveguide is about uh, 7.6 dB. So the fabrication of the integrating cylinder is is the same as the as the hollow core waveguides. You start with uh, two silicon two silicon substrates. And then you do deep reactive ion etching on one substrate to etch the cylinder and the excess waveguides. And then you do gold deposition on the on, on the two substrates. And then you do wafer bonding of the two substrates. Here you see the uh, silicon chip. Here you see the silicon substrate with two integrating cylinders. And on the side wall of the cylinder, we applied some roughness just to uh, to scatter lights in all directions so you that so you you can have uniform energy dis distribution in the cavity here you see is a a, a bonded uh, a chip with uh, with two uh, integrating cylinders while well, the the size of the the size of the the size of the integrating cylinder is about 5 mm by 5 mm and the and the sensor can be made uh, quite cheap because all these uh, fabrication processes, technologies, deep react, deep reactive ion etching, gold deposition, wafer bonding are all wafer skill fabrication processes. So this is the uh, measurement setup uh, to to measure the the liquid cylinder. You have a source, a broadband uh, thermal source. And the lead is coupled into the cylinder by by fiber, and then you have two two arms. In the sensing arm, you have uh, well the, the lead is collected uh, by a lens and coupled to a photodiode band on the lens, and in between the two lenses, I have a filter at 4.3 micron. Here you see the uh, transmission uh, spectrum of the uh, of the filter. Well, the, the reference arm and the sensing arm are the same, except that the the transmission spectrum of the of the of the two filters are different. Here you see the this the transmission of the uh, uh, of the reference filter and the sensing filter. The reason we use the reference arm is that we want to get rid of the common mode noise, which is from the uh, power fluctuations uh, of the source. And the reason we use lock-in here is that we want to, uh, because lock-in amplifiers are very sensitive to detect small signals. Basically, we want to detect 0.1% of power change on top of one microwatt. So here is the CO2 response of the nucleus cylinder. You see here the uh, the blue the blue curve here is the reference arm. You see that as I increase the CO2 concentration. The, the the sensing arm stays quite stable, but the but the sensing signal decreases due to CO2, due to CO two absorption. Well, you can see that the both the both both the sensing signal and the reference signal are, are quite noisy. So if if you nor, if you normalize the the sensing signal by the reference signal, you will get the the figure on the right. You see here the the signal is 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 much more smooth because you can you because you can get rid of the common mode noise by normalizing. So uh, here is the CO two response curve. Uh, you see that the simulation and measurements agree uh, quite well. And here uh, the 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 detection limit of the of the sensor is now about 100 ppm. So here you see a, a step response of 100 ppm CO2. Well, I did like 10 measurements and then put them together. You see a quite uh, clear and repeatable step response of the sensor. So here here is the measurements of the response time. Well. Uh, the response time of the sensor measured is about 2.8 seconds, and the simulated response time is about 2.6 seconds. But the the sensor has uh, has only uh, the the response time is only uh, uh, smaller than three seconds. That that's because you because the the size of the sensor is 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 quite small. So to conclude on the nucleus cylinder. Uh, we can have very long path lengths, about 3.5 centimeters on a very small chip area. 
and the fabrication of, of the unique witness cylinder is, is quite simple. And the performance of the sensor, we can detect uh, about uh, 100 ppm CO2, and the response time is, is, less, is less than, than three seconds. So now we have demonstrated uh, the Nagrinian cylinder can work as a, a as a sensor cavity. So next step is to increase is, is to integrate the, the source and detectors. Well, for the source, we use a mid infrared LED. You can see over here for the LED. And then we use two, two uh, photo dials as optical detectors. So here are the normalized spectrum emission spectrum of the LED, which is the which is the red curve, and the blue and green curves are the response function of the of the photo doubt. So you see for the LED and the sensing photo doubt, there is a very large spectral overlap, and for the for the blue and the right, for the for the for the response curve of the rest of the reference photo doubt and the LED, there is. Uh, uh, there's uh, there's still some overlap, but the but the response of the res the response of, of the reference photo doubt, there's no uh, overlap with the CO2 absorption. That means if you have a CO2 absorption, if 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 you have CO2 concentration change, the signal will not detected by the ref by the reference arm. So here are some simulations of the coupling efficiencies from the LED and to the to the photo doubt. The coupling efficiency from the LED to the input waveguide is about 8%, and the coupling efficiency from the output waveguide to the photo doubt is about 30%. So this is the integration process of the LED and the photo doubt. Uh, it's quite simple. Basically, you start with, uh, with one silicon substrate, and you do QH etchings, QH silicon etching to etch the trenches to house the LED and the photo doubt, and then you do gold uh, deposition and the lift off to defend the, the contact pads for the LED and the photo doubt, and then you flip chip bond the LED and the photo doubt in the trench, and then you do wire bonding uh, to access the, the, the contact pads. And then, well, uh, then, then you do a uh, wafer bonding of the bottom substrate and the, and the top substrate to, to make the sensor. Here you see some microscope uh, pictures uh, of the trench after, uh, after resist and then after lift off, you see the trench over here and you see two, two contact pads uh, for the chips. And here you see uh, the LED sitting in the trench with the wire bonding. So uh, I designed a trans impedance amplifier to amplify to amplify the signal from the photo doubt. You can see uh, the whole sensor over here. In the middle, I have the sensor chip, which is the negative cylinder, and also the LED source and detectors. And I have two arms on the PCB. Uh, on the on the top, the, the top circuit is is the TIA. For the sensing arm, and the bottom circuit is is, for, is the TIA for the for the reference arm. Here you see again uh, a CO two sensing measurement. You see that the reference signal stays quite stable, and you see the sensing signal decreases as it increases the CO two concentration. Here again you see the normalized signal. Uh, well. The detection limit of the of the full sensor is about uh, 250 ppm, ppm, which is one sigma, and this is measured with uh, with 30 seconds integration time. So uh, another another uh, the next measurements is about uh, the interference from water. We know that water has a very broadband absorption spectrum, and that can introduce uh, cross sensitivity for optical sensors. Uh, that of course depends on the spectral overlap between water and uh, your your your, tar your target uh, gas. For NDIR CO2 sensors, uh, basically NDIR CO2 sensors have very small water interference because there is basically no overlap between the water absorption uh, spectrum and the CO2 absorption uh, CO2 absorption spectrum. Here you see the uh, absorption spectrum of CO2, which is the green one and also the absorption water uh, over here. So you see there's basically no overlap. You see, oh well, 
the 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 absorption water here is magnified by by a factor of 100. You see, basically, there is no overlap between the water absorption and the IVD emission and the response of uh, of the photodiodes. So we so we expect no interference from from water. So indeed, uh, in the measurements here, uh, I. Uh, as I increase the uh, the the as I increase the 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 relative the relative humidity uh, of the gas, and the CO2 concentration is kept uh, at 2,500 ppm. You see that as I as I increase the relative humidity, the signal is not changing. That means the water interference is is below the detection limit of the sensor. So. Uh, in order to see how much the uh, water interference is, I did a simulation. Again, uh, so the the blue one, the blue curve represents the absorption water as I as I increase the relative humidity in the gas. So you see that the maximum uh, absorption water is 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 below one sigma uh, uh, of the detection limit of uh, of the sensor. So it's, it's, it's about 50 ppm of the CO2 sensor, but the detection limit of this uh, of, of the sensor is like 250 ppm. So you cannot really see the water interference from the from from the measurements. So uh, the next measurement is the is on the long term stability of the sensor. Basically, we want to see if there's if there's a drift uh, in the sensor performance. So I did the measurements of the sensor for for like five days. You see here the the red one is the is the sensing signal, and the blue one is the reference signal. You see that during the measurements, the five days, the the both the sensing signal and the reference signal are quite uh, the uh, the they change a lot. It's like fifteen percent of a change. So we we suspect that this uh, ch this change is due to the temperature uh, change in the lab. So I also measured the the temperature in the in the lab with a temperature sensor. So if if you look at the temperature profile, which is the black curve here, and you look at uh, your and you look at the sensing signal, you see a quite a strong correlation, a negative correlation. For example. You have a peak here, and you have peak here, and you you also have a peak here and peak here. So, uh, so this this confirms that the the baseline drift of the sensor is due to the temperature change, and this sensing signal and the reference signals they have opposite temperature uh, dependence. So, uh, for example, here uh, you see the temperature increases and the reference signal increases. So we think uh, this uh, temperature dependence is because of the uh, temperature dependence uh, of the LED and the photodiode. You see here on the LED emission, as I increase the temperature, uh, the the light intensity emitted from the LED decreases, and the for for the sensing photodiode, as I increase this as I increase the temperature. The response of the photodiode also decreases, and 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 it's also redshift. So this decrease in the photodiode response and also the decrease in the LED emission contributes to the uh, to the decrease of the sensing photo of the, of the sensing signal as a, as you increase the temperature. And as I as I increase the temperature, the refer the response of the res the response of the reference photodiode uh, redshift. So, uh, so you have a larger overlap between the between the photodiode response and the LED emission. So you have a larger reference signal. So the the solution to this problem, to this temperature dependence uh, of the sensor, is to either you can use a tech to control the temperature, or you can monitor the temperature uh, the temperature of the sensor chip and perform real time uh, calibrations. So uh, to conclude, uh, we have demonstrated a CO2 sensor based on the integrating cylinder with a detection limit of 100 ppm, and the response of the response time of the sensor is about 2.6 seconds. And we also demonstrated a fully integrated integrated CO2 sensor with a detection limit of uh, 250 ppm that is used for that is useful for leak detection. 
and the sensor has no water interference and the long term stability is subject to to the temperature fluctuations in the in the lab but this can be corrected by using temperature control so how would uh, the how would the how would the sensor compare with the with the commercial co2 sensors so i made a table so the first column is the, is is the sensor in the in, in my phd and the second column is the is the sensor is is the performance of a of a commercial sensor you see that our sensor is like 10 times smaller than the commercial sensors in terms of uh, size and for the cost of the sensor we believe the cost of the sensor can be lower because we are using wafer level fabrication technologies and the detection limits we are still uh, we are not there yet the detection limit is is about five times worse than the commercial sensors and for the for the response time uh, we, we are quite similar about 30 seconds so uh, in future works, the, the, the driving circuits of the IVD and the trans impedance amplifier and the locking can all be integrated on the uh, on the on the ISAC chip and uh, and you also need a gas membrane to filter out the, the dust and to to keep the sensor clean. Uh, performance wise, uh, we believe we can increase we can uh, improve uh, the performance of the sensor. For example, by uh, by closing the access ports uh, of the of the of the integrating cylinder, well, with uh, simulation shows that you can have a signal to noise ratio increase of uh, by a factor of two, and you can also look for LEDs and photo diodes with higher performance. For example, here is the uh, is 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 here is the is an LED from Hamamatsu. Well, the uh, we can have a much uh, we can have a higher optical power and then you can have a lower detection limit of the sensor well that's all thank you